Hello, everyone, and welcome back to, uh, to Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. Um, as we started last episode, it's May 24th, 2019. We're broadcasting from the home of Joanna and Scott Purvis. And we are uh, uh, already an hour and a half into an epic story. As you guys know, we really like to do these uh, in-depth uh, Mormon transition stories where we talk to a family about their upbringing in the church, their faithfulness in the church, and then uh, how things evolved slash unraveled. We've also had a series on bishops leaving the church, and in this case, uh, Scott Purvis uh, did serve as a bishop. Um, and so we're going to be answering the question, um, you know, what makes a Mormon bishop start questioning and losing his testimony? And what happens when a Mormon bishop's daughter comes out as lesbian? And how does the family deal with that? Uh, and then maybe even most importantly, how does a, a formerly Orthodox Mormon family that transitions away from Mormon Orthodoxy and or from the church altogether, how does that family uh, rebuild and regroup and find joy and meaning and fulfillment even after uh, Mormon Orthodoxy? So that's, uh, that's what we're doing. That's what we're talking about. And uh, we have with us today, you're leaning forward so much. Why are you so far forward? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm hot. That's fine. That's fine. Welcome. We have, uh, we have, we have Joanna and Scott Purvis. Welcome back to your interview. Thank you. It's good to have you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're continuing to break new ground on Mormon Stories podcast <clears throat> because we also have with us three of the four Purvis children. We have Maddie on my left, Sophie in the middle, and Jake on the right. They've been providing color commentary so far, <laughs> but uh, as as we kind of now get into this part of the story, right. you guys will hopefully feel more free to pop in and, and share your perspectives. Call Bull whenever you hear it and uh, and and share share your perspective. Thanks for joining us on Mormon Stories. It's good to have you. And sorry that Lily can't be here, but uh, wait, shout out to wait, Lily. Wait. We love you, Lily. Okay, so uh, so purposes. Yeah. So Joanna Purvi. and Purvi. Purvi is the so Purvi. Yeah. Joanna, <laughs> Joanna and Scott. We we left off last episode with you guys getting married in the temple. Yep. Which temple? Salt Lake. Salt Lake Temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we want to find the balance between getting good stories, but but uh, not making this thing too egregiously sure. long for listeners, but. Let's talk about your your family life, your early family, and kind of let's keep your Mormon story going. So right. what happens after you get married? What are the important highlights or, uh, you know, stories about your journey? We decided right after we got married, we were still in Salt Lake, and I had to finish school at the U. And we decided that we didn't want to go to a married student ward because, I mean, how do you serve in a married student ward, Right. We were here to serve. So we moved to South Salt Lake um, and we moved into a family ward and Joanna was the young men's or sorry, young women's president. And I was in the young men's, um, you know, 10 seconds after we moved into the ward, we loved the kids. They loved us. We had a lot of fun, super time. So what'd you study to you? Uh, business. Okay. Business. Yeah. I was a uh, recreation management and youth leadership at BYU. Nice. Okay. You stayed at BYU. Mm-hmm. So this is a Ute Cougar marriage. Yeah. Yes, it was. Was that a problem? Not really. <laughs> no. We like to give each other crap anyway. So. Yeah. And, but we left Utah so quickly after this that it we, it didn't really stick very much. Okay. Um, but we, we got right involved with this family ward and we were married. I mean, we were barely married and we went to a conference of some kind and we heard, oh. we heard the traditional don't put off family for education or business or it was general conference we got married in august conference? and general okay. conference said don't put off a family for get anything busy get have kids so we got busy and uh <laughs> so um madeline came along a week after our first anniversary so joanna was pregnant about three months after we got married and of course you know that's just the best thing ever to have a little baby come into your family and so that was that she was number one um we had this beautiful wave to our little, camera maddie Beautiful little <laughs> little blue eyed baby girl, and she was so amazing. Anyway, we were only in Salt Lake for two years. Two years, and then 
came home to Davis. So uh, my dad had started the, uh, an insurance agency at the same time I was born, and I came to work with dad and still there. So I have a brother who's a business partner of mine, a very active member of the church. He and I are partners now. We, we've bought out our dad. Just I mean, We're in the process of doing it since he passed recently. And our sister works with us as well. But anyway, that we came here in 96-ish and right back into the family ward. You and, and, and as soon as we got here, Joanna was once again young women's president right as soon as we got here. So the, the ward in Salt Lake was 33rd South and State, which I was just visiting Maddie two week, a month ago. For anyway, and I drove her, and she's like, wow, this is kind of a scary neighborhood. So it was the Southgate Ward, um, and we loved those people. Just, they were great. Uh, uh, they just salt of the earth, really good people. There were 24 girls in the Young Women's, and um, we just loved them. And they loved us, and they loved babysitting Maddie, and road shows, and basketball, and girls camp. and All those things I used to think negative about Utah... I now was in Utah, and my home teaching route was within a block, you know, that kind of thing. All this stuff I'd heard about as a kid, and I loved it. It was, it was a really sweet was, family yeah. award. We Wonderful really, family. really enjoyed our time there. So yeah. let's talk about how you guys wanted to set up your family. Yeah. What, what, how did you set up your family to be the right kind of family that would take you to, at a minimum, bishop slash mission president, and that would even give you the potential of, of greater opportunities. Tell us how you set up your family, Mormon, Mormon wife. Uh, well, I don't know if that, that's a tough subconsciously. one. Subconsciously. Yeah, oh, subconsciously. I mean, we were, we were going to have six kids. Mm -hmm. He grew up with five, I grew up with seven, and we thought six is good. But, and okay. with every kid, that, big num family, that's that number kind of came down a little bit, you know. Um, well, but, big family's a good Mormon, you know. Yeah, yeah, big family. But we love big family. That's so great. did you guys do family home evening? Did you do scripture study? Did you Growing up with serve the kids? your callings? Yeah, talk about your family culture, your Mormon family culture. <laughs> kids, right, yeah, I would say, yeah, family home every night, every week, but then the kids will contradict that and tell the truth. Yeah, I was going to say, this is where I can call some BS. Okay, wait, before you do that... <laughs> Get, let's hear your perspective. So as yeah. parents, what did you try and do? You can give your perspective after. Okay. So I, I would say the first thing we did was we, we were just going to have a lot of kids. And we were always going to be serving. And so I think if as the church and our family melted together, we were always going to be in a position where our kids would see us serving in the church. And we assumed our kids would be active in young men's and young women's and primary and all that stuff. So it wasn't a matter of how many kids should we have? It was just, we're going to be, our family's involved. We're, we're going to do everything. We're going to be involved. Well, and we, we had family prayer and we listened to and read the scriptures and we talked about everything. And we told them with all of our hearts, the most important thing for us as parents was to have them gain a testimony of their own. Like that was our purpose as right. parents. Because no matter what else happens, they need to have that for themselves. So, I mean, we, we, did, we did family home evening, not ever traditional, not like every week. We'd be good for a couple months, and then we wouldn't do it. And then we'd say, oh, well, let's go for ice cream. That's family home evening. So we kind of make a joke of like, whatever <laughs> totally. we're doing, that's family home evening. <laughs> but we did have gospel discussions, and we did talk about, I think that's been the, the thing that I appreciated so much was talking about important things that, that we believed in. And that was a tradition from her family. When we were first newlyweds, every Sunday night, we'd go up to her parents' house and sort of um, listen as her dad expounded on what he learned at church that day. And I loved it. I mean, it was wise and old stuff, old, the old good stuff. And we wanted to give our children that too. So we wanted to be able to have our kids ask these questions. So I tried periodically to do the dad's interviews with the kids where I'd pull them into the room and we'd PPIs. sit down. Yeah, like a PPI. But I think I did it kind of like, because my dad did that too, like four times. And I probably did that too. But, you know, it was, you know we, we had tried to, but there's so many things that you're supposed to do. It's hard to, hard to get them all squeezed well, in. And talking with our kids about what their testimony is and asking them, well, what do you believe? And do you, you know, do you have a testimony? And also... A big culture of, of our family was 
we were always the one putting up the chairs and taking down the chairs. Like, we're not going to leave until we're all done at the church or at any activity. Like, we're going to help go to the park early and help set up, and we're going to make sure we invite all of our non-member friends to this picnic that, the you know, like, we just, that was the culture that they grew up in. We're like, we're the purposes, and we're not going to leave until it's clean or, you know, I don't care if it's not our job. We're, that's our mantra so and i think we were kind of a blend of our our different parents i was gonna ask about that yeah, yeah. so there was there was the kind of meat and potatoes yeah practical mormonism mm-hmm. scott that you referred to last episode <laughs> for those who skipped the first episode bill real one bill real once told me john i will skip your first episodes and go right to your second episode so for bill <laughs> thanks real, a lot bill and thanks, everyone bill. else um, Scott talked about a meat and potatoes sort of practical Mormonism. Yeah. Tell the story about your dad th- that you told over lunch. <laughs> so my dad cannery one night. So we had a tomato cannery in Sacramento because there's so many tomatoes that grow in this area. And the church's cannery was here. So we it's not anymore, but we used to, every year we'd have cannery assignments. It was just part of the deal. And my dad on the way there, because I didn't want to go because we were teenagers and he, my older brother and I, and he said, you know why we serve in the cannery, right? No, we don't. And he says, if we serve in the cannery, then we won't have to eat this shit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and just swearing, right? It's kind of a folksy Gia Golden Kimball kind yeah, of. Yeah, and I care. I always, Mormonism. I always carried that along. I've always had sort of a potty mouth, as a, and I, and as I, demonstrated by my mission story. I heard but my I, dad swear twice in his life, and those were both life threatening. <laughs> <laughs> circumstances so it's a bit different yeah that was a little bit different so, so so how did you guys reconcile you know and joanna your your upbringing was more orthodox more bruce r mcconkey like so how did, did was did that cause tension in your marriage where one was like i'm sure scott's like i want to watch football on sunday or baseball on sunday yeah. joanna's like we don't do that on sunday how did you guys work that through well the bigger fight was she would say we're not watching football on sunday and then she'd go take a nap and i'd say <laughs> Okay, so I'll just sit here and twiddle my thumbs while you're taking a nap. So um, I usually just watch the 49ers anyway. You okay. know. Um, but that was tension quite, quite often yeah. about, you know, what language we use or what just different growing up in different households. You know, he had four brothers. I had five sisters. But we didn't wear church Two clothes brothers. all day on Sunday with our kids because it just seemed that I just couldn't get it in my head. Or, I couldn't do it. I couldn't enforce it. I didn't want to do it myself. Um, so those kinds of things, maybe not. Um, so Joanna, as yeah. the marriage is progressing, are you feeling like, yeah, I married the right guy? Or are you feeling like, oh, I married a slacker. <laughs> He's not the priesthood holder that I wanted. Or are you guys finding a good balance where you feel good about the level of spirituality? It's tough. The kids are like breathing heavy. We're right about here. to talk. We're about to have them call your BS. Yeah, so they're just like, know it's, this is some It's about to come. Shit. So. Um, <laughs> um, are we going to get the not safe like label on this no, one? Oh, no, I was really just don't hoping. drop that bomb. All right, no, that's um, So <laughs> there were times when I felt like, even recently, where I had to wear what I thought was the proper parent hat, the proper, like I had to be the mom. Sometimes he'll say, you're not my mom. I'm like, well, don't make me feel like your mom. <laughs> like, you know, the, those kind of things. So yeah, that, that has been, that has been throughout and still, but, but she would say, don't make me be the parent and you get to be one of the fun kids. And I think she was, so right she was, the, quite she, a was a, she was a strict kind of hard person. And, and you were kind of the fun, jovial, more relaxed, good cop, bad cop. I look at the kids. Is that fair kids? Okay, okay, let's give the mic to the kids. Give the mics to the kids first. And okay, so we're trying to get a sense for your, the religious culture, the spiritual culture in your family. Uh, what, what was it like from your perspective growing up? And we can start with Maddie, because she's the oldest. Oh, dear. And then we'll go, yeah, just different perspectives. Yeah, well, it was always... Early memories. Early uh, memories. Uh, religious, Mormon, kind of... Well, I remember starting young, we would watch movies on Sundays. The only movies that we could watch were like Veggie Tales or like the old animated Book of Mormon cartoon yeah. movies. Yes. And that was it. And that was nap time. Um, but then as we got older, we could watch like Disney and then we could watch like 
anything else. <laughs> that was kind of a slippery slope then. Yeah. Yeah. It was totally a slippery slope. <laughs> but especially when I was you know, like growing up, like it definitely per kid, as each kid kind of got older and older, it was more and more. And Veggie less Tales less. Were, were Bible stories told by vegetables. I don't know that I ever got and that. And it's, but... it's really pure cinema. So yeah. it, it, was, it was on the table for us. And those Book of Mormon stories and then the live action Mormon movies Book of Mormon. were on the table, but as we got older, less and less. You know, it was Disney, and then it was PG, and then so it was your parents PG became slackers. And... Now that's weird because he ends mm-hmm. up as bishop. But anyway, so but I mean, no, no, that... this is post bishop though. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. So let's do pre bishop. Let's do pre bishop. So Veggie Tales, what Veggie Tales, those old cartoons. I don't even know what they're still called, but they okay. the live... there's VHS tapes too. Yeah, the VHS. Yeah. Was, okay. The live action one was Lichen. Uh huh. Yes. Like in scriptures. Oh, yeah. My brother started one of those, by the way. Really? No way. Or he was an awesome. extra. Or something. Yeah. There's one that my sister Lily and I we were Nephi and Sam, and we acted it out and learned it. So what else? What else do you guys remember about your early church years? Um, I definitely remember our parents telling us. Like, definitely, we had a lot of like meaningful scripture time, but that was definitely like really early on in my childhood. Like I don't remember a whole lot of that. Like I remember I, I remember a lot more of the Disney movie phase. <laughs> um I don't know. I feel like Maddie would have more more about the early Can I just can I comment on that? Because just like just like sometimes kind of the word of wisdom law of chastity masturbation thing provides this impossible standard that then then wraps Mormons around the axle of guilt and shame. Right. So is it's the same with family prayer and scripture study and family yeah. home evening. Because yeah. pretty much every family I've ever talked to, it's like we tried to have family home evening, but we usually didn't, but we tried to, and then we'd stop, and then we'd start again. Right. Same with scripture study, same with prayer. That you know, you guys are like, come on, parents, you didn't really do that, or you did it sporadically. And I'm just saying that's every Mormon family I've ever talked to. You know what I mean? But but you feel bad about it, yeah, right? Do. Totally. And I just yeah. also remembered another thing: pre bishop and then into bishop, and then a little bit after, where it was the difference in like <clears throat> weekly chores and things to do, which is also came from when we were kids. We would have like. Um, the the paper to do list like mm, weekly chores yeah. and then we also had on those chore lists like do your scripture study do your other kind of things and that was pre bishop and then into bishop I think I remember having that t- chore list on my chore chart on my door and then we would have the family home evening um, like you hang your name on the thing you're supposed to do for family home evening one like and the younger kids would always get the treat <laughs> and then I, I remember the Lily and I would do sometimes the lesson. And that was pre bishop into bishop and maybe a little bit after bishop, but that was more. And that's and camp. that's another super common thing is that parents get more laxed as as yeah. as the kids go by. the The oldest kids, and and my daughter is gonna, the oldest kid, the, my two oldest kids, had it the worst, <laughs> and the younger two have had a little bit more. So that's that's probably not just a Mormon thing. But. Yeah, my has been great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. They, so any other Mormon memories? spirituality what would you guys think of your parents did you respect them did you did you guys want to be like righteous worthy mormon kids were you into it yeah were your parents annoying or did you respect them were they like strict and mean or were they like spiritual and inspiring something in the middle yes (laughs) i'll go i'll go um so you're next okay okay basically I, i always knew we were like kind of how my dad's family was raised. Like I knew we were like unorthodox in some ways. And then from my mom, it's like we were or- more orthodox in other ways. And I think it for us, our family, it was all more about just like a, more like real life principles, like being honest, uh, being loving, being kind. And I think that was always more important than scripture mastery. Um, so I, I never really saw us as like the golden Mormon family. Uh, but I think we were probably more active than any other family. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I think Scott's brand of Mormonism kind of won out a little bit over Joanna's in in the way your family was raised. Is that fair to say? Definitely. In some ways, like I remember for a long time, we had family prayer every single night. Every, yeah. And, but it wasn't like, okay, somebody read the scripture. But it was very, 
bonding and it wasn't about the Mormon church. It was more about us having a connection together and making sure we have our own relationship with God and like honesty and that stuff. It was just, I feel like that was more emphasized. Um, but we still had like the daily prayer. And How did you feel about, how did you guys feel about our family in our ward and in our stake? Like, how did you see our... Well, we were number one, first of all, but Maddie. <laughs> Jeez Louise. No, I, I think um, I think it was a, a good blend of both Purvis and Rudd came in, and I think the meat and potatoes kind of works. It's also kind of like a PB&J sandwich where it's kind of like different approaches from the PB&J. <laughs> and there's the structure, but there's also the color, and I think it wasn't just about being good Mormons. I think it, being a good Mormon or being a good person were kind of the same thing, and what it that meant meant being the hardworking one, being the one that was honest, being the one that put away the chairs, that all came into it. But it, w- it was a blend of both Purvis and Rudd approach to that, I think. Where it was, you know, you're going to read your scriptures because that's what a good Mormon does. You're going to fold the chairs because that's what a good Mormon does. And it, it, if that makes sense, it was a blend. One of, the, one of the things that Mormons sort of try and sometimes claim a bit of a monopoly on is just focus on family, family cohesion, connectedness. And I actually tend to think that when a Mormon family is functioning in a healthy way, they actually, we actually do families really well. Yeah. How did you guys just feel about your family cohesion and you know culture and connectedness as children in this Mormon home? And that's it's putting you on the spot, but hmm. did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you get along? Did you feel close? Yeah, so I think our parents from day one, they've always made it very clear that like we can always trust them and come to them for anything. So I feel like they really did that right because I feel like a lot of my friends feel like they can't just come to their parents with anything and just like regardless of what their parents might think um, or even if they think they might get in trouble for something. It's just being able to come to your parents with anything and trust them and know that they're going to love you no matter what. That's like the most important thing. Um, yeah. So you didn't feel like your parents were super strict and unloving. You felt safe talking to them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, good. Every rule they've ever made, of course, we're always like, well, why do we have to do that? But like our curfew was like, well, it's safer to be home later because the later you're out, the more likely there's going to be drunk drivers. So that's less safe for you. It's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I'll follow that. And it was very much respectful relationship and I think that really helps us a lot because if you have that respect then you can gain trust and then you can love and be open and we're really lucky that we're all close and it's cheesy but they're my best friends and I'm really lucky that they raised us the right way that's awesome what a great what a great testimony to you guys that's on the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast, we we just did a series on parenting, and we talked about Shafali Saberi and conscious parenting, and it's it's all about connection over control. Sometimes in the wrong type of religious family, it's all about control. If a parent wants to parent in the right way, in a more healthy way, it's just about do your kids feel comfortable talking to you, which means do you have a good emotional connection? And it sounds like you guys kind of nailed that. Matt, yeah, you say? I did. I, in terms of Mormonism, it's also different, I think, between each of the kids, because the four kids, we all had a very different experience with the church and our, and our family and everything. And for me, I remember, in terms of my parents and Mormonism, I remember always being proud of my parents. Whenever they would go for, give a talk, I was like, they're going to do a great talk. And I remember wanting to be that way, too. I, I wanted to be the person that that wanted to give a great talk that you know like that was someone and we've used the word spiritual giant before I I thought my parents were spiritual giants and I wanted to be like that as well and I so that was part of our family relationship too um at least for me growing up as a kid too and and that Mormonism part part of it was always there was always being you know we're gonna you know be an example like be a light those were all parts of being you wanted to be the female equivalent of Nephi is that right absolutely I mean who doesn't (laughs) he's he's the most yoked of ever other than um Moroni and uh, Ammon, the guy with the arms, right? Everybody <laughs> wants to be him too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, totally, totally Nephi. It felt like. How does it feel for you guys to hear your kids with this glowing report? Like, did you pay them? Like, was there? It's so sweet. It's very <laughs> emotional. It's very sweet. I, of course, am sitting here thinking of all the things we did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, we 
we were blessed with four exceptional children and I would love to take credit for um, a lot of this, but um, I really believe kids just come the way they come and parents job is to try not to mess them up as much as you can um, because these kids personalities came with them. So, I mean, they just, they're, they're these wonderful people. All right. And I remember all the we bad got stuff. The false I did. modesty. We're good. All right. All right. And I'm the best yeah. parent ever. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually feeling a little self-conscious about all the, we're the best stuff because we are all competitive, but the church in our family, I don't remember us ever comparing ourselves. I, it was just everything to us. Mm-hmm. It was just part of what we did. It was who we were. Mm-hmm. And well, I, we I loved been, it. I've been hanging around these guys. This is the second time I've been in the Purvis home. And I, I can just say, I can tell that there's a real cohesion here that's not feigned. And, uh, and I, my main point is I, I, I don't ever want Mormon stories to be the type of podcast where it's just bashing on the church. I like to bring out the good as well as the hard not only because I feel like it's true, there's a lot of goodness in Mormonism, but also if we're going to rebuild after Orthodox Mormonism, we, we need to figure out how to keep the good. You can't just throw away everything and then rebuild and, and never do any of the good things that you did as Mormons. You have to learn what was good, what was bad, keep the good and then replace the bad with better. And so it's important to be able to talk about the good. So, and and so the point I'm saying kids is, thumbs up to the Mormon upbringing, like b- yeah. prior to, prior to everything falling apart, were Absolutely. you guys pretty happy? Absolutely. And, and, and yeah. I really do think like being Mormon was everything. It was part of our identity yeah. too, I think. And it was a family Mormon identity. We were the purposes. We were Mormons, <laughs> especially once we started making friends outside of the church too. It even more became part of our identity, like soccer or with softball or with student government. It was, you know, like a, a thing. <laughs> I think it also, once you start to get a little old enough and you're not like a little kid anymore in the church, like a young adult almost, I think you start to understand like uh, some of like the social differences being a Mormon and you know, you're trying to set this high standard and example. Um, and I think that really becomes like an att- almost like an attractive feature of the church is that like you're like this morally high person compared to most of your peers at school at school yeah Yeah. because like i go to school where like you know my cousin's mormon and like maybe a a kid or two yeah but you know for the most part i'm like you know he's the mormon kid so you know you get a sense of pride with that um yeah yeah i call that mormon exceptionalism and for me it was saturday's warrior we were literally saved by God. We were the chosen, you know, this is back in the eighties. We were the chosen generation saved for the last days Be- <laughs> because, because God needed his best at the end to usher in the millennium. Now I, I didn't have to, didn't take me long to think about the fact that every single generation since the beginning of the church was told the same thing. And that once the second coming didn't come in my lifetime, I realized that Subsequent generations will be told the same thing. And you guys were told that too. But the truth is Mormonism makes you feel special yeah. and it makes you feel important. Sounds like you guys felt that. Yeah. You felt in some way superior to your peers, right? <laughs> yeah. It sounds messed up, but I mean, that's, that, it's like, it gives you like this false sense of <laughs> superiority. Yeah. That's where it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you could have friends who weren't Mormon, but until we were out I never had the same relationship with other people because it was always like, well, I, my family has the truth and like, we've got it and I want to share it with you. But it's like, there's, there's always a barrier. Yeah. It's it's just different. No, that's huge. That's huge because we're not like Scientologists, Jehovah's Witness, where it's like, stay away from other people. Right. Like we're not, in fact, we're taught to be missionaries. But we end up pretty much only hanging out with Mormons, even if we're living in Texas or California. Is that yeah. is that right? Yeah. So your friends, your peers, who were they? Each other. Yeah, and neighbors. <clears throat> but. So you still had no Mormon friends. Uh yeah. Well, there was. I was the only girl my age. So. Oh, okay. So in the mission field, it, the, yeah. you didn't have young women in your yeah. war, in your ward. And yeah, in my ward, I was the only. Oh wow. Girl, so. Yeah, it was pretty bare for youth. That's what I was saying, like, at school. Yeah. Like, 
even at the high school, we have one high school in our town. It would be surprising if I, like, I maybe see one Mormon kid a week at school. Yeah. Okay. And just walking around. Well, that's different than with, like, seminary and with young women's and young men's and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You're not having the same youth experiences that, that maybe yeah. others of us have. Right. That's the big thing with living here is the our stake. Oh, I keep sliding over. Our stake is becomes our social group. So because there are few in the ward, and even in the ward, like Sophie will be the only 12-year-old girl, and there will be 11 girls and all of young women's, but they're all very close, even though they're different ages. So your ward and your stake become socially, you become very close to each other, adults as well. Okay. All right, anything else you guys? I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that it's it's a pretty awesome upbringing as Mormon kids, yeah. as Mormon youth. Did you guys feel that way? Or? Yeah, because, I mean, the traditional values that are taught are valuable, <laughs> obviously. But just having faith in God and loving your family and um, honoring your parents and all that good stuff, it's, I mean, who doesn't want to be raised into something that's positive and trying to be the best person you can be and improving yourself each day. So what did God and Jesus and Joseph Smith and the scriptures and the prophet Thomas S. Monson or Gordon B. Hinckley, what did they mean to you guys growing up? Uh, Start with Maddie. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, it, it's funny. It really is. Each different kid has a different <clears throat> story with all of this. And I, I do remember young, my younger years, even when you were even younger than I was, obviously, um, talked more about that, but I remember President like General Conference changed over the different years, and it used to be that we would have set like Saturday and Sunday the whole day was General Conference weekend. And that's at least eight hours of TV, if not Content. ten, if you don't count priesthood. And, yeah, right? and it like you know a six hour nap somewhere <laughs> with all those hours. But but as you went older, it, it you would do conference as a family. Would do mm-hmm. conference as a family from home or at church from home. Right in that room. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, did you guys like have? Like cinnamon rolls or a big breakfast? Did they do anything? Did you have coloring books and? Yep. Oh, like, definitely coloring books. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, even because w- when we got older, it started to get to gray area where it's like, it's like you know, like if you had your phone out, they'd you know get mad at you. But like you know, you try <laughs> to sneak out your phone or, but uh, but, but every conference Saturday afternoon session. Everybody gathered in the living room so we could sustain the profit. That was the big one. Yeah, no matter where we were. Are you getting a little choked up on that? I am. Why? I don't know. I I loved the church, and I loved the prophet, and I loved the I loved that that um, that feeling that here I am, I've got my wife and my children together, and we're in our home where nobody can see us. We're not putting on a show for anybody. Only God is seeing us, and I'm, I'm leading my family and sustaining the prophet. And it felt like that was one of those pure moments where, you know, there, there's no phoniness about that. That was real, and I wanted the kids to see how much that meant to us, that we sustained the brethren. And um, that, was a big, that was a big deal. I still feel those feelings you know Ah. how about you joanna were were those special moments for you um i think a lot of the time as a mother i was in my head checking boxes like we're doing this right like right now we're doing this right so okay we're doing this right you know Mm. like so so many times as a not necessarily enjoying it no but just feeling like i'm I'm on the covenant path. I'm on the right way. I'm, you know, we're all here listening to the leaders of the church. A big saying from us has always been where much is given, much is required. So whenever we felt like we were sacrificing a lot, we're like, yeah, but we've been so blessed. And we are so blessed. So So, you can't ever like feel great about what you're doing. No. And and I I, I can't gripe about, you know, spending an entire Saturday sitting and listening to people speak about how I should be better because I have so much and I can sit and listen to this. I can, I can sacrifice my time and, and you know, anyway. Um, sometimes, and, uh, 
Spencer Nugent talked about this uh, just yesterday with his dad being a, a leader in the church in Jamaica. Sometimes parents are so busy serving in church that they sometimes neglect their kids. Did you guys ever, and we'll get to the bishop thing, did you guys ever feel that or was that not an issue? Before I respond, I, wanted, <laughs> I want to respond first. I just was going to make a comment. So when we came back to California, Scott was 26. <laughs> when he was 26, he was called to be in the bishopric. And from that time until he was the seminary teacher, so until you're 42, 42, 44, we never sat together in, in sacrament. So how many years is that? Eight years? or Almost 20. 20 years. So almost my entire ch time of taking children to church, like I said, I was the I was the one that would snap on the pew if they were misbehaving. That was scary. <laughs> but like Flashbacks. so 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 much of my experience at church is being a single mom because he was up on the stand. Um so I don't know how that is for the kids too if they remember him not sitting with us or if they I had some wonderful women in our ward who would sit right behind us and who would take, I was pregnant with Sophie when he was called as the bishop and Jake was a stinker. <laughs> he was two. And for years, they, I mean, probably for 10 years, they sat behind us. Cause you know, you know, you have the same pew that you sit in every Sunday and, uh, these people would help me take care of my kids. But anyway. So as you're reflecting back on that, no, keep the mic. As, oh. as you're reflecting back on that now at the time, were you like, oh man, I miss my husband. I wish he could sit with me. Oh, this sucks. Or was it like, we're doing our duty. He's he's climbing the ranks. He's serving the Lord. And this is all what, you know, the pioneer spirit, the Trek spirit. Much is given, much we, is required. We kind of like turn that. Yeah, Joanna, shut up. It's, so were you, you into know? it? Yeah. I and You I weren't think, grumbling like No, Soraya and I, I think or, he became so, it, that's just how it was. So it wasn't, I didn't think how it would be normal. Like, I don't know how to explain like, it, it was so, it would have been abnormal if he came down. I would have thought, what, did you sin or something? Why aren't you up on the stand? Like, it was just, I would, it's so, how it was. So, Scott, for 20 years, you're you're doing what when you're not sitting with your wife? Well, let's say let's say for 20 years, it was probably 16 of the 20. Right. Maybe not straight through. You were but what? I was, I certainly was never home Sunday morning because I was either at BYC or Bishopric or... Or not these, BYC, are, what are the, these are award leadership award meetings. council meeting. The leadership okay. meetings would meet, okay, right? So the state, the leaders would meet before church. So I was always at church by six thirty or seven thirty in the morning, and then I would see them when they would arrive. And um, when I was in the bishopric, I couldn't sit with them. Other times, I was you know on the high council or whatever my calling was. Which you'd be traveling to other yeah, so wards. I could be in another ward or maybe I'd be there. So there were times when I'd be there, but consistently, almost never. And so she, she would, I mean, the, remember the other part of this is she also had to get four kids up and dressed and fed and off to church without, your help. without me. And so it wasn't just sitting through the, the service. It was the whole morning. And then when she gets home, I'm still not there. And then you get home at two 30 or three. And then many times you're back at six or seven for a fireside or training or whatever it is. That's Sunday. Yeah. Like there's the there's this idea that Sunday's a day of rest, and Mormons believe that, but that's not well, that's not the reality for I, me. And I tell you, that's a real sore one for me <laughs> because um, I remember one of the local leaders saying, no, 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 it's not a day of rest, it's a day of service. <laughs> and I remember thinking... Wait, no, what did Jesus no, no, no. say? Wait, can we just open up the Bible and look at that one? You know... Um, and that was, but you were into it, you were still doing it. I was, but I also... Well, I'll get to my bishop story. My, yeah, but... I was, I, th I would say we were a little both. I mean, we were doing all this stuff and we were into it, but we also, you can't help but feel the strain of, of the impossibility of doing it all. Yet, if you start to complain, you feel selfish and then you beat yourself up for not sacrificing enough. And then you go back to work until you wear out. And then, I mean, I'm kind of, this is the theme of the next 20 years of our marriage, but, um, that's, that it takes a toll on everybody. Mom, dad, kids, everyone. It, you're just constantly burning up. Did you, do you want to add anything, Joanna, before we have the kids talk no, about that? Wait, Mike, Mike, Mike. I just felt bad I took it away from the kids. Oh, no, don't. Uh, I, I just, I know that it took a toll on them, especially later, 
um, because I would have callings and meetings before church as well. So it'd be up to Maddie. So I'm leaving right now. I'll be back here at 845 to pick up all you kids. You guys got to be better be ready. I'll be back here. And then we have to get to church, you know, but I was at a meeting before church as well. So it's like, you know, he's at a state calling or what, you know, after his, he was in the bishopric and then a bishop and then he was in state callings. And then I was ward callings and state callings and then back to ward you know like we're and the kids are just you know and we just expect them yeah to, to step up step up kids over the past five-ish years this this term within ex-mormonism has emerged called second saturday where <laughs> where progressive and post-mormons who skip church on sunday now just love the fact that they have an extra saturday versus sunday and it really is born out of the fact that sundays mormon sundays are grueling yeah. Or at least they have been historically, right? And since we're on the Mormon Sunday starts at Saturday at about five, because at that point I got to make sure that I have shirts ironed and the phone's starting to ring. And if I haven't had my, and if I didn't have the the agenda finalized for meetings the next morning, and and right remember Saturday sacrament. morning is a special day. That's the day we get ready for Sunday, right? which is a song that the little children sing, right? It's the day we get ready for For Sunday. Sunday, We wash our clothes and we (laughs) do whatever else and we get ready to go to church all day, you know? Um, And so, you know, Saturday is, is busy in the morning because we're cleaning the house and getting the, you know, how you got to do that stuff. And then maybe you got a little time in the afternoon, but then about five or six, I would feel this feeling coming on. Like, and I would even say to her sometimes, well, the weekend's over. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's tough, especially when you got a young family. I mean, I like to go, I like to go play ball with the kids as much as the next guy. And so that, that's hard, but again, more to, more to, more. Kids, your perspective on your parents serving and anything else Sundays, any of that stuff like Maddie, let's ask you. Sure. So you, th- this is common, this sort of the burden of the eldest to like be second mother. So put upon. Right? You know, just really load all the burdens on me. <laughs> but, but, but in a lot of ways, no, it was kind Margie of true. Margie felt this. My wife felt this. She had to take care of it. Because her parents converted to Mormonism and then had four more kids, Margie was kind of second mom. And she, she came into the marriage a little bit resentful. She was like, I only want two to three kids because I've already pretty much been a mom. So I don't know. Do you? Do, I'm trying to project that on you, but no, no, no. Yeah, I, I do get that a little bit, and I think it, it. I didn't. I same thing. I, it was just the way it was. It, Dad was a bishop. Mom had some calling, probably, or was doing something with the ward, or was helping somebody, or you know, whatever. And so, if I had to help, that was just the way it was. And and I didn't recognize. In still now, I'm still recognizing um, how it doesn't have to be that way. And, but I wouldn't have been able to recognize that. Like, it doesn't have to be this way. Dad doesn't have to be gone all day. Mom doesn't have to be gone right now. I don't have to help the kids help or help the kids get ready. You know, like it, it just, that was, it did, it took for me to rec- see other families where dad was home all day on Sunday, you know, for, for me to recognize, oh, that could have been our family too. It just, it just never was. Um, and I guess the, the silver lining, or I guess when, when I was that kid helping or when mom and dad were gone or something like that, it didn't feel negative <laughs> because I, I didn't know any different um, for, for some, some days. Um, and it, I also did, even at a young age, feel that pride in my parents being, you know, doing their thing and being good Mormons and being busy and giving talks and, and going to different wards and everything. So I, it wasn't as negative. Looking back, maybe I do have a little bit of like, oh, man, I wish there were more times when we could have slept in on Sunday and you know, had waffles and seen, you know, watched baseball. But, but as a kid, it, it didn't affect me negatively that much. So th- this is one of the paradoxes, and I want to get to you guys too, but this is one of the paradoxes because on the one hand, we're all talking about how intense, how hardworking, how much we love our Sundays now, how grueling they were. On the other hand, in modern America, there's a there's a real sort of epidemic of depression and anxiety. There's a lot of people that are isolated. There's a lot of people that are lonely. There's a lot of people that don't have a sense of what their meaning and purpose in life is. And for as hard as this was for you guys, as grueling, as tedious, as busy, as frenetic, you also knew your roles, you knew your place, you knew what was expected, you, you, you were busy, you were engaged, you were serving. Again, meaning, purpose, spirituality, roles. There's something about that that I think is, can be really healthy. Right. Yes. And so it's it's a paradox because we're kind of bashing it, but at the same time, 
like you said, it was kind of good news, right? Yeah. I was never bored. <laughs> right, never bored. There was never time to be bored. And if you found yourself like, <clears throat> I'm not doing anything right now, then find something to do. <laughs> or like do something, you know, productive. So, I mean, there that is another silver, li silver lining is never being bored and, and always having something to do. <laughs> You're also <laughs> gaining least. talents and skills, right? And relationships right, sure. and connection. Sophie, what were you going to say? Um, I was just going to say that has actually been the hardest thing for me being outside of the church now because I'm ending my junior year in high school and everybody's talking about college and what you're going to do. And it just, it was so much easier before. It seemed easier because it was like, okay, there's the three BYUs. Yeah. Um, so you can just choose which, any of those. Which BYU? Like yeah. that's a lot of choice. Yeah. And now it's BYU like, you one, can go BYU anywhere. Two, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's been really hard for me. And we'll come personally. back to that. But, but, but you're saying there was a simplicity there. Yeah. It's really nice, but then it's, when it's gone, it's like, oh, I have to actually use my brain. That kind of sucks. So. <laughs> Did you want anything, Jake? Yeah, I would say for me, I always feel like <clears throat> I kind of came out of this a little bit differently than my rest of my siblings. But wait, let's stick to the chronology. Oh, okay. So talk about, talk about the past before we talk about now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I, I guess uh, I just kind of cut I you off. I what I was going to say, so... Uh, is there anything awesome. you want to say about that time where things were super active, super busy, super crazy with the church? Peak Mormon. Your parents were, yeah, peak Mormon. Peak any, Mormon. any other feedback on that? Uh, no, it definitely, I agree. Like, I would just piggyback on the fact that, like, we had purpose and, like, the fact that we knew, even if our parents were gone and, you know, we had a little bit more on our plate, we knew it was, you know, for a better purpose. We didn't really mind. Um, yeah, and it wasn't, like hard work or anything it's not like we were stranded by ourselves yeah i felt like it was us kind of like learning to be responsible and like taking care of ourselves even though right? we, we were all still really young i think like we all grew up kind of quick and we're just taking it as like oh well this is what it's like when you're older and you got to be responsible and this is what we do and just kind of went with it what about actually attending church? Did you guys like attending church? What did you like? What did you not like? I never... <laughs> Jake Shaken said no. Yeah, that, that, here's where I come in like... Hmm. I was a bit different than my siblings in this way. I feel like I never really got into it as much as they did. Uh, even though I was the one who like had the priesthood, I feel like I just didn't... I don't know. Uh, I enjoyed... The responsibilities I had with passing the sacrament and even blessing the sacrament, I thought that was really unique. Um, Did it make you feel important? A little yeah, bit? but I don't know. I just felt like, I don't know. I just felt like any of the kids that were there who say the right questions, or sorry, say the right answers to the right questions can get up there and do that too. So at the same time, it, it didn't feel that special. I don't know, just because I knew, I knew the people who I was growing up with in the church, and, you know, I don't know. Were you planning on a mission? Yeah, yeah. Actually, funny story, um, I always felt pretty pressured to go on a mission, even though I wanted to go on one myself, because my dad had actually gotten me scriptures when I think I turned 12. <laughs> And it said, Elder Jacob Purvis. <laughs> so it was pretty much in the books. Yeah. That's so Mormon. Literally. Uh, on the books. It's pretty the Mormon. Books. <laughs> Not in the books, on the books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I always knew I was going to go on a mission. Uh, that was just a fact. It wasn't like I was like, you know, the whole praying, praying to go on a mission and, you know, f find my purpose. I, I just knew I was going to go. So it wasn't. A huge disappointment for me when I didn't because it wasn't like a testimony filled reason I was gonna go it was more just like a I was gonna go right yeah yeah all of our kids were gonna go <laughs> yes yeah we're planning on it but but see that's that's almost like Scott's upbringing again because it's like uh, you just get the kids raised, give them a good experience, and then the mission is what converts them. Right. And that's so Mormon. Like, that's one of the geniuses of Mormonism is the missionary program because it's really that two years of indoctrination that really seals people's commitment and beliefs 
and determination and uh, loyalty, you know, church. Well, and our kids grew up hearing how much we loved our mission. Right. And they they and know our, the they mission, know our, yeah. we stayed with our mission president. They know our mission president. Like, like they like they heard good things. They they heard it was hard, but it was a good thing to go. Some oh go ahead, Manny. Oh, I was I was gonna actually differ from Jake a little bit. I think maybe more maybe more so. I had more my mom's gene where I was gonna go on a mission, and I was a spiritual about it. Even in high school and younger, I was I was gonna go. Our parents met there. <laughs> they had a great experience. They from a young age we were gonna go, and I wanted to. I wanted to go and l- memorize all the scriptures and and be this rock star missionary and come home with a hundred baptisms and. Actually, I don't know how many baptisms is a lot. A million baptisms. And, you know, and <laughs> That's a lot. Totally. But I think a little bit more than, than Jake or maybe even Lily and Sophie, I, I, I wanted that spirituality. Yeah. And I still, to this day, am sorry that my kids are missing that experience. Yeah. Um, there are so many things you learn on a mission, and I'm sure you can learn them in other ways, other places. But you work hard, you're challenged, you have to overcome homesickness and, and relationships with companions and yeah. me, being in people's homes. If you want to learn about the world, go be in people's homes for a while. Mormon missionaries learn so much about the world just by being in a different place with different people and having to get to know all these different cultures and people and families and tastes and you name it. And that's an experience my kids are missing now. I'm sorry about that. I really am. I'm sorry they missed that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, Maddie and Sophie, did you guys ever uh, watch the boys advance, you know, deacons, teachers, priests, Eagle Scouts, even watch your brother pass the sacrament, prepare the sacrament, bless the sacrament? Did you guys ever have that thought of like, wait a minute, why are the boys doing important things, getting recognized, holding the priesthood? And and the girls are kind of uh, yes. Did you have those thoughts? Talk I did. about that. I didn't ever want the priesthood because that was not something that women should do. But I was always a little bit jealous. Like even when Jake would go with you sometimes and do things, I was a little bit jealous that you know that that was the thing. But I didn't know why I was jealous. I didn't need to be. I was definitely also jealous of the fun things that the boys got to do, oh. um, the young men got to do. You know, like, like scuba what? diving, and we were over here knitting like every. <laughs> Every other week, or scrapbooking, which I I love scrapbooking, <laughs> but but I you know was that well, was to, to be Sophie. Fair. What do you wait? So let's have Sophie talk real quick. So <laughs> Sophie, you just you threw your head back with the with the like a big deep sigh of exhaustion. It's just for me, I was kind of annoyed, but at the same time, like my mom didn't have a priesthood and she always kicked ass. So I was like, <laughs> well, I don't need the priesthood, so. I can just do what she's doing, and I'm still going to be better than these guys who are passing out the sacrament. And I would be jealous, and then someone would have to run to the store and get bread for the next morning. And I'm like, wow, I'm so glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> I remember now thinking about the other boys in the ward that were my age. I don't know if you felt this way. Yeah. My age boys, not just family, but definitely feeling jealous of kind of the attention that they got, where I felt like I had to hold the standard and I, I had to keep it that high. And they didn't have to. It always kind of felt like they could do whatever they wanted and still got to pass the sacrament and you know do all of that kind of fun stuff and be the cool people at the high school. And I always felt like kind of the nerd. Like I felt like I was the Mormon and they were the cool Mormons. <laughs> and I, partially, I think it, I felt like that because I was the girl and they were the boys. Right. What were you going to say, Jake? Well, I forgot what I was going to say, but picking back on what Maddie just said, I think that's so true. Like it totally is like a boys club, you know, the Mormon church. And I kind of was able to see that from, you know, like well, you were since part of I joined it. the priesthood. Yeah, I was in it. So, <laughs> uh, oh, I still tease my sisters to this day because it's funnier now. But back then. Um, but back then, obviously, I'd rub it in. I'd be like, <laughs> we get in an argument and I'd say, well, well, Sophie, come on. I have the priesthood here. So <laughs> who do you think is right here? How'd you like that, Sophie? <laughs> I spend a lot of time in my room alone. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah. Meditation works. Sometimes. Okay. All right. So, um, should we talk about becoming bishop or, okay. So, so that's a big deal. So how old were you, uh, Scott, when you became bishop? I was 29. Seriously. Are you joking? No. 
No, How old is Thomas S. Monson? That's really young. I think he was younger than that. I think he was 25 or 26 or but something. But 29, that's like historically young. Plus, it, it's like the 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 boy the boy coming home because it's in the ward you grew up yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And had your dad been bishop in that ward? Okay, so Ty, that's that's kind of a big deal, and it's the thing you wanted for so long, and you wanted Joanna. I I have to, so I got the phone call. So I had been in a bishopric, I had been in ward councils, so I got to see how things operate, and I and our bishop was moving. In fact, he had already moved. He had to fly back to town for the Sunday he was released, and he kind of gave me a heads up. Hey, there, you know, I'm moving, and watch out. And then I got a phone call on like a Wednesday night that I had to be at the stake center Thursday night with my wife. And I knew what that meant. And my first thought was, I guess I'll be in a bishopric again. Um, and then it started to hit me just conversations I'd had with these other guys and thinking they're not really going to not. I mean, I thought this was my going to be my future to lead in the church, but I, I mean, I was young. Joanna was really close to having our fourth baby. So she was really pregnant. And we went into the stake president's office and, and we asked him, well, when will this take place? And he said, before that baby's born. And, and it was quick. It happened the next Sunday and I was in and I remember we were sustained. The bishop left, literally drove to the airport and left. And Sunday school, they set us apart. Actually, you're ordained a bishop and set apart as the bishop of that ward. That's meaningful for a young guy because the stake president went to my dad and my father-in-law who both had served as bishops so they could stand in to ordain me a bishop. My mother had given my dad a painting for his bishop's office and he gave it to me with his name and dates he'd served on the back so that I could put that in my bishop's office and then give it to my son. That's right there. So, you know, this is a big emotional thing I knew that my dad was proud. I knew that my father-in-law was proud. That's a big deal. You know, your father-in-law is proud of you. That's, that's a big deal. There's someone else important in your life. Yeah, I know. Besides no, your she, dad and, and father-in-law. She, and Who? she, I, I don't remember fe Joanna feeling proud. It was more like we looked at each other and said, all right, this is what we said we were going to commit to do. This is what we told the Lord we would do. It's gut check time. We're in. And off the races. But that Sunday I was set apart the meeting ended. I was in the bishop's office by myself thinking, what, are, what am I doing here? And my older brother came by. He was in the ward, knocked on the door, gave me a big hug, slapped me on the bottom and said, you got this. And there was a line down the hall, four or five families to see me. And they knock on the door and say, can we see you, Bishop? Hmm. You know, and like, an hour ago, I was, you know, I was just another Joshua. guy in the war. Yeah. And, and I, and frankly, the first family that came in to see me about serious issues, this is five seconds after the meeting ends, was somebody I grew up with. These were right. parents of somebody I'd grown up with. Yeah. And they're asking me about financial issues and family problems. And I'm thinking, I, 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 don't, I don't know anything. What was your training? We had two or three early morning meetings where we went into the handbook. And in our stake, we had a very, very dedicated stake president who was, I mean, he didn't have a hobby. So I like baseball. You know, his hobby was being in the church. He <laughs> loved it. The guy was as dedicated as you could be. And so memorize the handbook. Yeah. So that meant in our stake, the kids are kind of like looking at each other. Kind of. Well, they know what's bit. coming <laughs> that in our stake, the bishops and bishoprics, we knew the handbook because we were constantly training and retraining and retraining. But there's a very big difference between knowing things like I knew that when the stake president showed up, that I was to tell one of my counselors to sit behind me so that the stake president could sit next to me on the stand. Right. I knew where people were supposed to be. I knew how many meetings to have, when to have them, who was supposed to be there, what which, are the which, variations which hand were. To pass the sacrament yeah, which hand to pass the sacrament. <laughs> um, you know, who should wear, you know, when you take off your coat and when you don't. I mean, we knew all the unwritten rules and the written rules. And we were very, I mean, to this day, I probably can still cite most of the handbook of that, what, what was, you know, the handbook yeah, of that right. day. Um, and, uh, but then we took it to an extreme. And that's where, things got bad for me in the beginning because here we were looking at each other in this moment like, wow, this is happening and we're going to 
we're going to do what we told the Lord we were going to do. We're going to serve. And um, the demands on a family, we talked about Sunday, but, you know, then Monday is family night. And if you're not doing something formal, at least you're just home together as a family. And there's something church related. Tuesday night is youth stuff. Wednesday night is bishops interviews. Thursday night, the phone's ringing. And then it's Friday night. And then Saturday starts the get ready for Sunday. And, and that's what you do for five or six years. And um, emails in between, phone calls. I mean, it doesn't ever stop. And so, the, so, Joanna, what was it like when he got called? Was this like, woohoo, another checkbox? Like, we're on the right track, or this is validation that the Lord must love us and we must be doing things right and we're on our way to the goals that, that I set as a young woman? Like, I think Scott described it pretty well when he said, like, we looked at each other like, okay. Lord, here, here we are. Like, send us. Send us. You know, let, let whatever you need us to do, we'll do it. And um, so, that's that's all. Um, this was April of two thousand or March two thousand two. Yeah. And Sophie was born first week of June. And um, so no, like pride or like excitement or oh, like no, they're, they're validation worried. or joy I, I or a little I, bit of like woohoo I was um I was proud that that my parents got to see Scott in this light cuz he's such a joker and my parents aren't and so for them to see him acknowledged as Oh, I guess he is a, a good young man. You know, <laughs> I, I was. I yeah, and Mormonism is calling equal worth sometimes, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. and it, and it, yeah, I I was proud in that way. I I didn't feel the whole. I it, it literally it was just like, okay, boots and saddles, let's go. Mm. Some of the positives, though, oh. I was the bishop of a ward where I had fifty mothers, and all these old couples in the ward knew me since I was a kid and they, they, they were so kind and the old bishops, um, they each had their style. They would come up and they would just sort of hit me on the elbow, shake my hand, give me a wink. And they all called me Bishop. They didn't call me Scott. These are the old 70 year old, old bishops. And, um, one of them had been a mission president. His son was the stake president and he would always come up and pat me on the back and say, you're doing a good job. And it meant the world. And the old ladies in the ward would, would sometimes, they would, they would mostly call me Bishop Scott or Bishop Scotty even, <laughs> some of the old ones. And I hate being called that, but I, I loved it. They were, I just had all these mothers in the ward. And so, so I had that. Just, I just, it made me feel comfortable. It also made me feel overwhelmed because I couldn't believe I was supposed to lead these great people. But we really were youth people. You know, when you're a leader told me once when you're staffing a ward as your young men's president, you need a boys man, a guy who can be with the boys because he needs to be with the boys. And that was easy for me. And it was easy for her too. So between Joanna and I, we just, we could do anything with the youth. We'd have firesides at our house. We'd have all kinds of fun stuff. Our kids who were younger then got to be around the older youth. And so we had a lot of fun, positive stuff with the youth as our calling, I say our calling. Joanna was a counselor to me. In fact, I was taught. Not was, literally. No, not, not literally, of course, because she didn't have the priesthood. <laughs> but I was told in my very first interview with the stake president that I should use her as a counselor. So she talked to me about all kinds of stuff, not the private stuff that you can't share, but the ward, the youth activities, all that kind of stuff. And then she was always there. So this was staffing it was kind of I mean, you can't say it's a team effort when she's not allowed into the meeting but you know she helped me enormously in the bishop role not just at the home um but it, that that's where things then things started to get busy i don't know where we transitioned into All right, got so, hard, but so what were the best parts about being bishop and then we'll talk about the hardest parts the best and, and I want to hear from each of you about that question. My favorite parts were girls camp. Going what about out. it? Bishops went up Friday night and you had about a half an hour and the girls were so excited to see the bishop and then you would do a little spiritual thought and then they were done seeing the bishop and they'd go back to do their stuff and then they had the... And you love that why? 
I think because I just loved the kids. I loved the boys and the girls in the church. And um, I felt like I had this, they had this awesome girls camp up in the Sierras and they had such a great week. We have this fabulous girls camp. And then I got to come at the end of it when they were all pumped up with the spirit. And then they saw the bishop come and that was a big deal. And then you and all it's like Davis feel, versus Woodland versus Winters versus Dixon. Yeah, this is our like, ward. So you'd break off as a ward on top of a rock under the pine trees and have a, have a moment like, you know, kind of special stuff. Man. It is. And then, and then they would all go back to their girl stuff and have fun. And then I, we, the bishops got to stick around for the big Friday night fireside testimony. and testimony meeting and singing. And then I'd go home. It's magical. It was totally that stuff magical. Is magical. I loved it. And with the boys, I had scout camp. But with the boys, I felt like I got to be with them because I'd be in priesthood meeting with them. And, and so I got to teach them. And that was what I loved. Especially the boys who were starting to think about missions. And we would get to sit down in the office one-on-one and just talk about stuff. And they could ask me questions about how hard it was or, you know, I think they felt like they could let their guard down a little bit or if they had been masturbating or something. I didn't beat them up for it ever. Why not? Because everybody masturbates. Yeah, but that's not every bishop's attitude. No, but it isn't. Um, But I remember thinking, I remember lying to my bishop when I was 15 and I was just, I just assumed they all did. So if they came in and were upset about it, I was more concerned about the fact that they were just beating themselves up. Um, I rarely ever restricted anybody from the sacrament, especially the youth, because it didn't make sense to me. And I knew that you're... You yeah, know, you need the sacrament when you're struggling. That's not, what I thought. Yeah. I thought if I take the... When I take the sacrament, I can block everything out and I can think about God and the atonement and my week and what I'm going to do different and what I did wrong or whatever... And I just under, didn't understand why we kept that from people. So it just that, that part never jived for me. And I think some of the youth appreciated that. I also hated the idea when you've got four young men. Shame. Any young man who's not passing the sacrament is going to have at least two people come over to him and say, we need you up front passing the sacrament. And, he has and to I just say, wasn't going to do that. I to can't. Him. I couldn't know. do that. You know, yeah. like that's awful. And yeah. so... Uh, you know, the boys have to deal with some of that stuff too. And we, and, and the girls have all that modesty and all that stuff, the shaming that goes on. The guys get it too. Because if you're not up there on the stand, everybody know in the ward knows that you're looking at pornography and masturbating or whatever it happens to be. That's awful. Especially when you're in those teenage years where you're worried about what everybody thinks about you. And, and I just, so I, I felt like I gave the guys a break on that because I just didn't, I, I thought it was right. Yeah, the youth. So we connected. Him. We, I connected with the youth. So did she. That was the best stuff. Um, and then occasionally you'd get these unique opportunities, like when the Sacramento Temple was dedicated. I was a bishop, so we got to go. You know, we got the say the hierarchy thing. We got the inside tickets, so we didn't have to sit in the stake center. We were in the temple. You know. So yeah. you know, there's things where you get to go to these training meetings and hear an apostle or something like that. So there were some things like that were really cool. And then I'd come home and say, "Wow, I." I got to meet Elder Perry tonight. Did you do the Hosanna say. shout in the? We did that. Yeah, yeah, we Maddie, did that. Maddie, Maddie, Maddie and Lily, Lily were there too. Maddie yeah. and Lily. Lily had just turned eight. Yeah. So we did all that. So there were some great times. No, nope, you didn't. You weren't old enough. So we, I had good times as a bishop. Okay. It, it wasn't all bad. I mean, I, I can't say that it was all bad. It was always busy and it was always stressful. So you, you love the youth stuff. Loved them. Yeah. All right, Joanna, what was the good about being the bishop's wife or having your husband be bishop same same thing working okay. with the, working with youth and, yeah. and and i i i know i've said this before but our ward and our stake um like we know everybody it's like it's and everyone's like we, we know everybody and so when you're yeah. in leadership callings you get to know the others it's just and the same good handful people. of families in each good ward people. are doing everything. Yeah, good people. Uh, yeah, same ten yeah. people are doing everything. So good people. That's okay. All. Yeah. Uh, were you ever were you ever resentful about his time away? No. The, well, actually, let's get to the negative stuff. So, okay. So, what were the hardest parts for both of you about being bishop or the bishop's wife? Why don't you go first. Okay. I just was thinking what I'd say after you finished your part. You no, it's okay. I, um, I think the hardest, I always felt obligated. Of course I did this before and after to have like new members over and to host, um, 
have families over for dinner to get to know them and just the socialization part of being a part of a ward and also in our ward because it's so transient with UCD, the, with the university, um, we always had new young couples coming or going and um, so I, I felt like I had that stewardship, I guess, um, but I also like having people over. I said, didn't stop after he wasn't the bishop. So um, that wore on me. Also, um, I remember towards the end of his time as bishop, he was having a really hard time. Um, and a lot of that, he'll talk about his relationship with the state president and the just the wearing down and the meanness and the negative. I remember Saturday nights, he would be just so grumpy and, and depressed. And Sunday mornings, the alarm go off at, you know, 530. And I remember sometimes taking, going with him into the closet and he'd be, he's like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. And I'd be praying like, the, I'd, I would say, I'll pray. And I'd pray to God. And it's like, please help him just get through today. Just help him get through today. And I I had so much anger and resentment towards people who would treat him poorly, and I just completely unnecessary. I think this is just ridiculous. So, also, I remember talking with Scott uh, probably six months before he was released. So, like the spring of two thousand eight or yeah, and I and I I hadn't had a calling that I had enjoyed. I had been like a secretary here and was helping in the primary and doing things. And I know during he, the time I was bishop, he wouldn't let me yeah. have a calling with the youth, which I was, which is what I loved so much. And I remember feeling like I was stifled or being punished. Yeah, in all and of, I remember all talking. All we were trying to do was balance our time. No, and yeah. I, 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 but I just remember thinking, I'm, I'm not happy in my role. What about just your? I mean. Traditionally, as I've understood it, you don't call 29-year-old bishops. You call bishops when their kids are older right. because it's a very demanding time when you've got four young kids under the age of 10 yeah. in the home. Yeah. What was that like for you to just have him gone all the time um, with four young kids in the home? Or was it just pioneer? You said strap your boots on. Bootstraps, yeah. Pull, yeah. Um, duty. Duty and also the much is given, much is required. Covenants. Covenants and... Mm. I, just a flashback to my depression when I was, you know, 15. My father had depression. My grandmother had depression, which I found out all this later. But um, my patriarchal blessing says that joy comes from service. So when you're not happy, look at how you can serve others. So with my depression, if I got unhappy or upset or something like that, my answer from God in the letter <laughs> says, serve more. So not only were we doing so much church things, but I would be leading something in PTA, and I coached each of my kids in basketball, softball, soccer. Baseball. You know, like Both of us. volleyball. I, I would reach for more. I led a, a neighborhood play here, and I, I wrote a new play for the the, my maids and I you had like the women of the neighborhood over to teach them the gospel. I, I was constantly trying to do more to compensate for my depression because God told me in a letter to me, if you serve more, you'll be happier. I really relate to that. I, sometimes if you just don't, don't keep yourself busy, you can fall into funk. And so you can just spend your whole life staying busy to avoid either resolving some demons or just to avoid a personal disposition towards being depressed. Right. So by staying super busy, you, you don't have time to be depressed. <laughs> so the way I relate this into talking about Scott being Bishop for me as a mother, knowing that I had to take on more responsibility because he wasn't as available. Yeah. I would get more involved in my kids' lives. So I would say, I can do that. I can do this. So I was trying to be more of a super mom because he was the Bishop. Right. 
makes sense. Yeah, yeah. She coached the, the junior high volleyball team. She ran a thing at the elementary school for like 15 years. They called the Scarecrow Breakfast, a fundraiser. Anyway, just, just, I mean, it's just she just did everything. Yeah. But it would burn out. Try, yeah, and, but, you know. but, but a lot of that initiated when he was the bishop because I wanted my kids not to miss out on not having their dad as much. So really quick, is, the, is that negative or positive? Like you're, you're basically saying, you could interpret what you're saying as saying that the church kept you from falling into depression. Jake wants to answer that yeah, question. Yeah, I want to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> well, I think from the kid's perspective, the pressure of, it's like peer pressure, I feel like. My dad is the bishop, you know, you would see him being this spiritual giant and being a spiritual leader. Um, and my mom sees that and she says, oh, I have to, I have to do that too. I have to set this high example. And that's also part of her competitive nature. But I think that has a lot to do lot to do with the church and in a way that took a lot of my mom from my childhood because she was so damn busy with the PTA and every other thing that she felt that she had to just take over and set this example of like a hard worker um, and <laughs> sorry um But yeah, it really, you can see the wear on a person when they feel like anytime they're not adequate or they're not doing enough that they have to do more. And it just breaks my heart. It, it, it's really hard. Um, How much of that was because you needed your mom and she wasn't there for you in the way you wanted versus just you feeling sad about how yeah, it, it was for her health? I think, luckily enough, I've been uh, raised to be very independent, and I'm an independent person. So I felt like my childhood wasn't necessarily impacted as it could have been. But I, I just worry mostly about my mom, just how it just wore on her. Yeah, just what how was, What were your fears? Well, I mean... I or concerns? Yeah, you know, I still have concerns, just... Um, just that she died even, early, even after, that she was miserable. Yeah, and like, after after leaving the church, um, you know, that's a huge void of just, like, stuff you've done before and work to keep busy. Um, so, you know, after that, you're just looking anywhere for more jobs to do and more things to take over, you know. But that's now. But at the time, you were worried about... No, at the time, definitely. It, it's hard to think at the time I mean looking back you can see it a lot more I think because you know at the time I'm in elementary school or junior high and it's a lot harder to see that so it's a lot more retrospect I think for me but uh sure yeah and and what my kids saw but probably couldn't put together because they were so young was that their mom was either running a hundred miles an hour or she was in the bedroom with the door closed doing what depressed Driving. with the sheets up over her head because there, she only has two speeds, and and, for, and the church provides endless opportunities to serve, and and Joanna was a victim of her own willingness to just dive in, and and that really hurt her over the years. It still has, yeah. But again, we're I'm, and I'm not really getting ahead of myself because this started in those early years when I was a bishop or she was serving in the busy callings. There was never enough to do. I mean, there was never enough good. You always had to do more. And it, it became a chronic, almost obsessive thing. But I think it wasn't obsessive. She was just fighting off this demon of depression all the time. And then eventually it catches up. Uh, thanks for being vulnerable, Jake. All right, so for you, what were the th parts you didn't love? So I thought a lot about this because I hate talking about somebody who's not here. But the reality of the situation is being a bishop's hard for every bishop. Most of the bishops in the church are the best guys you'll ever meet. So, um, but the hardest thing I had to deal with as a bishop was the stake president. It wasn't the confessions or the infidelities or the hard things, and those things could be really hard. Um, but I was in a stake where it, we had a leader who was um, who really did rule with an iron fist. And the hardest part about all of that for me was I was serving in the Lord's kingdom, like. 
I, I thought we were the ones who were bravely, nobly going to save the world. But then I would go to a PPI and just get beat up. With your stake president? Yeah, with the stake How president. How often would you have those? Every month. What's a month the bishop meets with the stake president? Well, here we did anyway. I don't know how often. It's in the handbook, John. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't make the bishop yeah. level. So I would go over there. So all the way driving there, I'd be stressed out. And then I would get lambasted for an hour about what I was doing wrong, what I wasn't doing Give enough. us examples. So like what are the types of things? I'll give you a couple examples. I remember several times being in the meeting and we would have an hour long meeting and we'd get to 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes. And he would say, okay, do you have any other additional items you want to talk about? And I would say, no, I'm good. And he'd say, well, and wait, what, what were the types of things you would tell him about? Or just, just to give us a sense, you know, basic, what stuff are you like, reporting? To basic stuff president? like ward goals, um, progress on, you know, are we staffing enough people for the coming dance? Whatever the issues were that month, you know, what was our ward? Is it like ward attendance, temple attendance? No, not that activity stuff. Rates, no, it was more about the, uh, youth, con youth conferences next month. And your ward is supposed to supply so many men, so many women. Do okay. you have those men? Do you know who they are? Or do you have those women? Do you know who they so are? So meeting stake obligations, basically. Meeting obligations of the stake, but then also following up with me on things we should have been doing in the ward. And then wanting to know what, what our, like, okay, then we would look at how many people are endowed without recommends and how do we get that number up and attendance or uh, home teaching numbers, how do we get those up? Uh, it was always about those key metrics and, and there, what was the phrase they used? The key indicators. That was the, <laughs> that was the phrase they always used. And, and those, now I'm forgetting what they were, but I think, you know, recommend people endowed with a recommend was one of those indicators of whether a family was active or not. And so those were key things we were focusing on. Um, and, and honestly, that, that means they're paying tithing, right? Yeah, it if, does. If they have the temple recommend, it means they're paying tithing. It does. And I've heard a lot of that in the ex-Mormon community. I cannot ever tell you that I ever once heard in a training meeting ever, we need to get the tithing numbers up. I, mean, I just never, ever heard that. Right, yeah. I mean, we need to get the activity up, but I mean, I'm sitting there hearing that message because these people need to go to the celestial kingdom. I wasn't worried sure, about their sure. tithing. So. Well, the leaders don't get the money. No, no. But they, they're the enforcers. Yes, Yes, we are. <laughs> um, but he, this is. But th he was tough. If we ended up with time, he would say, "Well, since we have time, why don't you turn to page three hundred and seventy-two of the handbook?" Oh, shoot me now! And he would sh open it up, and he would say, <laughs> "And I remember this one: Aaronic Priesthood Presidency Meeting. Are you? When do you hold that?" Well, we didn't hold it because I had like four active young men, and they were the same guys that were going to be the Bishop's Youth Council (BYC) meeting. So having another meeting was completely redundant. And I could point to him where Elder Perry told us, we don't have to do everything in the handbook. Let's tailor this to meet the needs of the ward, not the other way around. He didn't want to hear that. Um, but worse than that, it was always at the end would be, all right, Bishop, I want you to go home. I want you to read this section and the next section, write a report and email it to me of what you learned and how you're going to implement that meeting in your meetings. What the heck? And that went on for six like years. Like homework? Yeah. Like I didn't have enough to do. And the, or I'm going to commit you, Bishop, will you, the old will you questions, will you read the entire handbook in the next 60 days and, and then call me and tell me what you learned? Um, I mean, a bishop's oh. got so much to do. You don't have time for that crap. And not to mention the fact that we were so well trained in all this stuff. I mean, he would find the nuggets that nobody cared about. And then, and then he'd look at you like... He'd look at me like, you really, you're you, not doing you, this? You didn't know that, Bishop? <laughs> but worse than that, it was, way, it was actually quite worse. So one night I had a PPI with him. And I got a phone call from a sister in the ward who was an older lady, not active in the church, married to a non-member. He was in the hospital dying, and she reached out to her bishop. Now, this is a lady who we have visited for years who didn't come to church. But her husband's dying. And she asked me if I would come and give her husband a blessing. And I said, absolutely. Because of course you go and give a blessing. I was trained by my mission president, by other leaders, that the spirit trumps the handbook or anything else. When a woman calls you to say, come give my dying husband a blessing, you do it. So I went. On the way there, I called the stake president, left a message and said, I'm going to miss the PPI, but we can catch up later. I mean, we do this every month. And I went and I, you hated him. <laughs> yeah. And he was mean, you know, and I, and, and I was so young, I didn't feel like I could stand up for myself. And I'm embarrassed about that now, but I was following my leader. You don't question your leaders. Yeah. So anyway, I, I go to the hospital. She was so grateful. 
So I have this moment with this lady and I hugged her and she was so sad. And then he passed a couple days later. Anyway, I get home that night and I'm probably getting near bed and the phone rings. It's a stake present. Where were you? And I said, didn't you get my message? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I was giving this woman a blessing. And he said, when you have a meeting with the stake president, you come. You can send anybody to give a blessing. Ugh. And I just, I just, I didn't know what to say. I, I was taken aback by this. It almost sounded like he was joking. It was so absurd. And Scott was crushed. Like you could just see him just. It was like finding out your hero is not really a hero. Not because I use this guy as a hero, but because. It was like this isn't the way it's supposed to work in the Lord's Church. I, I I was I was blown away. Another time, we had to do this ward goals, and he he um, he gave he said here's a sample of what your ward goals could look like, and he had a format. He said I'm just giving you some counsel. If you want to use this, this is what you do. So we had this big ward council meeting, and I got people prepared ahead of time. We were going to plan our mission plan. And the ward council, it was one of those rare ones where everybody really got into it and we created this thing and I sent in my ward goals to the stake and he calls me and he says, what is this? That's our ward goals. And I'm all excited like the little kid, you know, is bringing home the picture to their parents. And he says, I gave you the format. Well, he said, what about that format that I gave you? And I said, well, well you said that was a, just, you know, you were counseling us. That was your suggestion. And his response was, you're going to find Bishop that when the brethren give counsel, that means instruction. Those are directions. And I said, so did you want me to use your form then? Like, <laughs> and he says, no, I'm telling you, you do whatever you think is right. But you know, I'm telling you what I, what the brethren. And, it, and so I hung up the phone. I got out his paper. I filled some numbers in and, fa and faxed or emailed it into him. And then he sends me an email and says, thanks. This looks great. And I, and I just, I always felt like I'm not really the bishop. I'm, I'm the state president's representative in the ward. And, um, and, and I'm sure anybody listening to this is going to say, oh, he got offended. That's yeah, why you're church. prideful and I'm got prideful, offended. Prideful, arrogant, offended. And the fact is, this guy offended me so many times, I can't even count. <laughs> that still has nothing to do with why we love the church. But, but six years, it was five and a half years about when I was starting to break down. And you just, you just can't take that abuse. I saw him call people out in meetings. My mother, who was a saint, had a fear of praying in public. Deathly afraid of it. And she hated getting emotional and she didn't want to do it. And everybody knew, you don't call on Marsha to say a prayer. Because she just let it be known. She just is not comfortable with it. Well, he felt it was time for her to get over that. So he called on her unannounced in a state conference and embarrassed her because he thought she had to get over that. He did something equally as cruel to my father, and we probably don't have time for it. But No, I'll tell that story. My dad always had a beard. And the beard thing's so silly, but my dad had a beard. That's all I knew. And... Going back when I was in high school, Elder Marlon Jensen had come to our stake and was so young and cool, general authority, and my dad was a brand new bishop. And Elder Jensen was introduced to him, and he pulls my dad aside. And this is like a famous story in our family because we don't have general authority stories in our family. <laughs> and he said, Bishop, don't ever let anybody tell you to shave that beard because we need more individuals in this church. And my dad was so relieved and so happy that this general authority had said something just... Didn't need to, but made his day. And it was a really kind gesture. Years later, I'm bishop. My dad's a counselor in a bishopric in another ward. And in a leadership meeting where the bishops are all sitting at the high council table. And you were there as bishop. Right? I was bishop. I'm sitting at the, at the bishop table. The counselors are all sitting in the back of the room. My dad's one of them. And the stake president says that we need to set a higher standard. The temple standard. You can't work in the temple with a beard, and that's the standard we're going to maintain. And everybody in our stake knew the Elder Jensen story with my dad and a beard, because my dad had told this story a thousand times, and it's a cute story. And the stake president absolutely knew all this. And rather than talking to my father as a man, in privately. Front of, privately, in front of all these men, he's the only one in the room with a beard. 
the stake president says, from now on, anybody in a bishopric or high council needs to be clean shaven. As a matter of fact, Elder Jensen, who had come to our stake again the previous month, which was odd, he says, as a matter of fact, I talked to Elder Marlon Jensen about it, and he says he feels very strongly too. And I knew it was bullshit. And I, but more than anything, that's my dad. That's my hero. And you don't need to treat people that way. It's cruel. And I would never do that. My dad would never do that. None, none of the other men in that room would have done that to another person. You know, I, I never saw that stuff in church leadership except for this, this person. And um, it was devastating because I, I covenanted to live and serve in the Lord's church. This can't be what that means. So after five and a half years of that and watching my wife fight with depression and overexerting herself and depression and back and forth, um, I finally went into him and said, my family can't handle this anymore. I, I, I need to be done. And he said, when the Lord calls us, we don't release ourselves, but I'll go ahead and make it happen. And uh -huh. he, which means basically I felt like I got fired. And then you get released. And it would have been nice if somebody would have said, thank you. I don't need a parade or a potluck dinner, but just somebody to say thank you. But nobody does. And that's a cultural thing we do in the church. Not even ward members, really? Yeah, maybe a couple pats on the back. Um, but there's no like celebration. There's nothing. And, and frankly, I used to be embarrassed to say this, but I think we need to do a better job of thanking people for serving in the church. Like, yeah. What the heck is wrong with that? Especially these guys who kill themselves in these extremely difficult jobs, and then it's over, and you're expected to just say, well, all right, on to my next calling. And I was on the high council in five minutes later. And um, again, I, that kind of sounds like it could sound petty, but it's not. You gave everything and then you're fired and it's over. And um, your family's gone through this ordeal and there's all this time away from your kids and your spouse. And then you get treated like crap by your leader for all these years. And then it's like, all right, well, I guess we'll let you out of it since you can't hack it. And We'll throw you on the high council, the bishop's graveyard, you know? Yeah, but then it was Prop 8. Something that got us through, I think, a lot of that time of having feelings hurt and, and being resentful and, and angry at this person, so many times Scott would say, you know, everyone is, has weaknesses and everyone's human, but the Lord wanted me to serve with him so I can know how not to serve with other people. I, so I can learn how, how to be kind and I can learn how to... So that made him more, mm. more sensitive and more kind. And, and that's something that, that kept going through that. Like, why would the Lord have him in this calling? Like, and it's like, well, maybe the Lord wants to prepare me so I can not pass this forward or something. I don't know. It was, it was, it was extremely disappointing. So here I am now, all that same hope and vigor of wanting to serve in the kingdom with my sweetheart and go charge forward. And I was left feeling sort of beat up and tired. And then about three months later, I got the phone call that asked me to lead the prop eight campaign in our town. Maybe we'll talk about that in the next episode. You bet. And I'm just going to say that, um, there's going to be like friendly and unfriendly GAs. Like we all know Marlon Jensen's famously warm and friendly. Yeah. But there are, there are stories of like Boyd K Packer, Bednar, Holland, <laughs> being really, really mean and tough in private or, yes. you know, in, in closed groups. And you have to think, not to make excuses for the stake president, but you have to kind of think the the ecclesiastical apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Like they probably right. were trained by GAs or area authorities that were just really harsh, I'm guessing. And so he may have felt, in, it's possible he felt empowered to treat his bishops that way. 
um, that because that's how he had been treated by area authorities and general authorities. Yeah, and, and I remember thinking later, like maybe it was some sort of weird Mormon karma that I was the hard guy leader in the mission fields only to come back later and be serving beneath the guy who was mean. Um, but, you know, that's silly. But uh, but it's extremely disappointing when you have your heart set on, hey, I'm going to be part of this movement. I'm, we're going to, we are... Leaders called by God, save for the latter days, and we're going to do these good things. And the whole time you're fighting with your leader over things that you think you're supposed to be doing. And then I'd have these inspirations to do something, and then he'd say, no, you can't do that. And and it's just, it was really disappointing. The stake president that followed him was probably the nicest person in the world. And I, um, and I think everybody was relieved that we got the nice guy next because everybody needed it. I wasn't the only one, you know. Really quick, how'd you... What was tithing settlement like? I, I hated being on the receiving end of tithing settlement. I wonder what it would like to be the bishops. Like, did you pay up this year? Like, how's the money going? You know, where, where's the money? Show me the money. I want to hear about that really quick. And then also, did you have to do any disciplinary councils while you were a bishop? Okay. The money thing and tithing settlement actually was interesting for me. I didn't really understand the purpose of it because the only people that come in are active tithe paying members. Everyone else doesn't show. Nobody else doesn't come. <laughs> you know, like, so... Um, What's the point? And, and it kind of felt like... And it's always around Christmas. So <laughs> yeah. you're there all this extra time right. when you're trying to get to the holidays. And you're, you're, you feel bad asking one of your counselors to be there because they got Christmas stuff. And then it's every active, busy member comes in with a plate of Christmas cookies. And so in some ways, it was really great to just have a nice sit down... And the members felt so good because they were able to declare it. Yes, I'm a full tithe payer. And so it made them feel good. But I remember thinking, I think we can do this by email. Like, um, <laughs> yes or no. Yeah, I don't think they'll do that. For that, I'm predicting that'll be a change in the future because it doesn't, I don't know. Okay. Disciplinary councils, I held the several as a bishop and I've been on a whole bunch as a high council person. Um, I held three or four as a bishop. And it's almost always a woman because if it's a man who's endowed, typically the stake handles that. Um, and those, I had mixed experiences. You know, I had one where a woman was living with somebody. She was totally inactive. And it's the stake, always extramarital sex, right? Usually. Yeah. yeah. And the stake president called me and said, hey, we got this guy in one ward and he's shacked up with a woman in your ward. So you need to have a court on her. So I called this lady who hadn't been to church in 20 years and said, hi, I'm the bishop and I need to have a court on you because you're living with somebody. And she says, what are you talking about? (laughs) And, um, and I, and I remember this one woman saying, listen, we got to do this thing. If you don't want to come, it's fine. (laughs) And and I never have said that out loud until this moment. (laughs) Um, and she didn't come and we excommunicated her. It's just ridiculous, right? And um, I had another woman who was cheating on her Jesus husband. would do that. That's, That's what Jesus exactly did. what Jesus would when do. When he caught a woman in adultery, he's like excommunicator, right? Yeah. I sat. I, so at the ward level, I didn't have hard ones. I had some gnarly ones that I was on as a high council guy. You know, um, we had a kind of a high profile case where a local leader was... Um, he was a medical doctor and he was molesting his patients Ugh. and he went to jail. And so I was on that one. And so we had a few weird ones like that, but it's still, it's usually sex then even on the, on the stake courts, but they're embarrassing. And for people that don't understand how it works and, and your audience probably knows all this, but just really quickly, there's the stake presidency, which is the stake president is two counselors. 12 high councilmen, that's 15, plus a clerk, that's 16. Men. Men. White men. White men, usually. <laughs> um, and then the sinner. Because that's what you are when you're in that that's, meeting. It's overkill. And they come and they sit at one end of the table and everybody else sits around the rest of the table <laughs> and stares at them. And then they have to stand up in front of everybody and talk about how they just had an affair or whatever it was. And it's terrible. And the first time I ever went to one, I remember thinking... I will never, ever sin. <laughs> I will never be that guy because that sucks. Like, I do not want to be in that position. And it's embarrassing. And I, I had a man in my ward who'd been unfaithful to his wife, and he was excommunicated while I was bishop. So I went with him, and I sat next to him during his court and basically just had my arm around him. And I, I just kind of felt like I, try, I had to try to help shield this guy. Even though I was mad at him for all the stuff he'd done, I just thought, this is awful. And so I, I know, the, 
the tough ones, and I have one story I actually sent in to Sam Young that if you'll allow me to share about a yeah. confession and youth kind of thing. This is the one thing the entire time I was bishop that haunted me. And I had a young woman come into me, uh, into the office privately on a weeknight when it was quiet, nobody was around. So, you know, those, you always know something's going on. And she was in high school, cute girl. So you think about the ages now. She's 17, pretty girl. I'm a 31 year old man. We're in alone in this meeting in this room with white noise machines and a locked door. Right. And she starts to tell me about all the sexual relationships she's having with a boyfriend. And I never dug for the details cause it was gross. And, um, but I was concerned because she was doing a lot of sexual things with this boy. And so there's some risky behavior involved. So I'm drawing on high school sex ed and I, my, so I remember asking her, have you talked to your folks? No. Will you talk to your parents? No way. <laughs> okay. Well, that locks me in too. Can I talk to your parents? Because sometimes I could call a parent and say, you need to talk to your kid about this thing. But only if the kid gives you permission. And she says, absolutely not. You can't talk to my parents. Okay. Have you talked to the school nurse? No. Why would I talk to the school nurse? <laughs> Well, the behavior you're engaged in has some risks with it. She's, oh, well, we're not having sex. Now, you're an insurance broker sitting in a meeting with a 17-year-old girl who's telling you about graphic sexual stuff because that's what she was doing. And I'm feeling like this girl is in... And I asked her how many other parts... So I didn't want to get into the details of how you get an STD, but I, wanted to, I had to say, oh, how many other partners has this boyfriend had? Oh, he's only ever been with me, Bishop. He loves me. <laughs> and it was just clear that she was in over her head in this relationship. She was in some risky behavior. So, and by the way, I don't know if you're just self-editing or if, if I'm projecting this in, but I, I remember meeting uh, a, a college professor from California when I worked for MIT who told me this story about these girls somehow ended up telling her, California Mormon girls, that they had anal sex with their boyfriends because it wasn't sex right. and that way they could be worthy and still go on missions. And so the, but the girls had no idea the health implications of, of the, being the recipient of anal sex. Oh, awesome. Yeah. 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 And so I don't know if that's, you were editing a little bit or if that's what you're referring to, but well, that is what I'm in referring some to. cases, I mean, some of those things, the, I... some of these things, you need an education, you need to know the implications and you're, you're under the impression they call it the poop hole loophole, where <laughs> where you're under this impression that it's that it's not sex, yeah, but it's sex, you know. Yeah, well, that's yeah, <laughs> and and more importantly, it's dangerous or it can be dangerous. Yeah, and I and I still feel like an allegiance to this young woman to not get into that. I but whatever. Okay, so I you did. Can, you I can, did it for you. You can connect the dots. <laughs> but I'm in this position now where I feel like I need to protect her. I I, I mean I honestly wasn't. I didn't want to make her embarrassed, but I felt like I had to explain to her how she could be affected. And again, drawing on my high school sex ed and your insurance and I'm trying in my insurance <laughs> knowledge, I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain to her how diseases can be carried in the seminal fluid. And I'm trying to think of the most like medical terms. Cause I didn't want to, and I murdered it. I mean, I completely murdered it. I'm sure she left that room thinking that pig, disgusting. And, and I left there thinking that was the worst thing I've ever <laughs> sat through. Both of us were embarrassed. Both of us were completely uncomfortable. Nothing positive came out of it. She probably still left feeling like dirty and bad and all that. And I felt like a creep. But I had, I had nothing. One time I asked the stake president, can you give me some advice on what to do when somebody confesses sin to me? And he looked at me like, you idiot. And he pulls a piece of paper out of his um, binder or whatever with some scriptures on it. here. You might want to use these. You see, and this is one of those really fundamental problems. If you don't inherently know what the right answer is, you better be careful in asking it. Because if you ask a question that you are supposed to know the answer to, maybe it's because you're not worthy. So when the bishop says to the stake president, I don't know how to counsel people when it comes to sin and the atonement and repentance. 
and I don't automatically know that, the stake president looked at me like, there must be something wrong with me as a bishop, as a man, as a priesthood holder, whatever. So I got no training on that. And when I did ask for it, I was basically treated like I, I, I wasn't good enough. And I saw that repeat itself in other things where it's a get in line and just salute the flag leadership model, not a, hey, I don't know how to do this. Can somebody help me? There is none of that. And that's dangerous because then what I relied on when counseling people was what the bishop told me when I confessed to doing stuff. That's the only on-the-job training you get for that. And that's a real problem. And it ended up, this, this young woman could have left that office, gone home and told her parents that her bishop was prying into her sexual stuff. How do I protect myself then? When really all I was trying to do was help her. So anyway, I wrote that up and sent it into Sam Young. He put it on his thing and whatever. Yeah, the church needs to train its bishops. And it's, it's you know, Sam Young's protect... LDS children or protect all children movement isn't just for children. It's to protect bishops and church leaders against the risks right. of abuse or harming people or, you know, their own mental health and awareness. What if, what if she like, calls my wife the next day and says, your husband made me feel uncomfortable. I mean, that never happened, but there, there's some real problems there. Especially in, in the, the Me Too kind of era. That's right. Uh, the church needs to protect its bishops more. Probably more now. Than I mean, ever. it needs to protect children most of all. Yeah. Uh, but but protect your bishops. <laughs> yeah, because these are good men trying to do their very well, best. Except for you, maybe. except me, but <laughs> no, uh, and Bill Real because he won't listen to the first hour. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, it's 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 incredibly difficult, stress filled, emotional, and then you're left to whatever comes to your mind. And here's the bad part: is that's because that's where the spirit's supposed to come in. Right. So if you don't automatically know how to handle it. You must not have the spirit. You must not have the spirit. Yeah. yeah. Isn't he, I think the church should get rid of confession just in general because the Savior never had people confess in front of him. He just forgave them. He just like, don't do it anymore. I don't think, I can't see him asking for specifics. It's so stupid. Was there any part of you that was worried that your bad relationship with your stake president was going to jeopardize your kind of next level of advancement? I felt like the time I served as bishop was preparation for greater things. And as... He told you that. Yeah, and he told me that as well. Um, and I, I'm, I, I, it's hard for me to say that because it, that's, I feel um, I'm trying to be vulnerable here because those are the things you don't admit. But I felt like this was training for the future. By the time I was finished, I, was, I, didn't, I didn't want it anymore. I didn't want to be a leader. I still felt called. And now it felt like a burden of duty. And, um, and I knew that I had fallen out of favor by the time I'd finished my term. And so a good friend of mine about the same age was called to be the next stake president. And I was happy for him. He wanted it. He was wonderful. But I do remember feeling like um, I had my moment. I wasn't ready. I didn't perform up to the standards the Lord had required for me. And, uh, and, and that, was, that was it. And my time had passed by. Not in a terms of I need to be heralded as some apostle, but I had been preordained to these things in the preexistence. Remember, God had laid his hands on my head and ordained me to these offices already. That's what my patriarchal blessing said. And so then when it didn't happen, I knew that I had failed. And um, to know that you're 35 years old and you have failed your purpose here is, is very heartbreaking, especially when you feel there's some real unfairness to it and you're trying to set an example for your boy and all of my children, but, you know, I have this boy who's going to carry on my name and all that stuff, and, and he's seeing me upset. That's, that's, that's really, um, that's life-changing stuff, because I still felt called to the work, but I felt like the Lord had called, and I failed, and it was time to just, you know, be a good ward janitor for the rest of my life, and that I didn't use the gifts that God had given me. 
Joanna, what was it like for you to see him feel that way and conclude, kind of conclude all that sacrifice, all that effort, all that heart with him feeling kind of washed up and defeated? What was that like for you? Very hard. It's very defensive of him. Very pissed off at this person. I was going to say people. Um, but again, my role as his helpmate and sucker was, sucker? you know, the S U C C O R. Oh, yeah. It's like one of those old, one to those old provide sucker, like one of those old, he, one of those bomb. old yeah. help meet terms. Help meet. <laughs> yes. To empathize with you. Anyway, I um, just that's when we prayed a lot together. And a lot of times I'd have to offer the prayer because he couldn't. He was too choked up. He couldn't even speak. And I, I just always, and I would tell him, it's like, I know you. I know the Lord knows you. And whatever this is, we're going through, we're going to get through it. And um, the Lord still has, still has use for you. And we'll, fi- we'll, we'll figure it out. She got me through. So we're, we'll talk about this. Next episode will be kind of how everything unravels. But... For those who are going to want to, as you said, just sort of say, oh, see, he got offended, and that's why he left the church. Yeah. To what extent, when you're finishing up your time as bishop, were you, like, doubting the church, doubting your testimony? Zero. Wanting to leave, like, thinking that this was the end? No. So what, what, what was your mindset? Uh, the, the way, Joanna your already said this, I, I and felt like it was... To the church. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I felt like it was training, which is also why it was so hard, because I felt like I had not passed the test. Um. But mostly I made peace with it because there's jerks everywhere. And most of the men I know in the church who are in leadership positions are wonderful. And we got a jerk. The but, state, you know, I mean, it happens. But the church is still true. But the church is true. Still, that, the priest is still restored. I mean, like, you know. You, you can have unnecessary meetings and endless emails and a jerk stake president and not enough time with your kids. But the church is true. So if it's true, it's all worth it. So I was hurt personally but the church is true. So what's their, yeah, that wasn't even a question. Okay. It wasn't even a question. Okay. This was 2008. Yeah. We left in 2016. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. All right. Mormon stories, listeners, you've heard it. We've uh, got another two hours hearing from the Purvis family about, uh, you know, Joanna and Scott's uh, marriage and raising the, their family, raising their kids, and then Scott serving as bishop. Uh, don't go away. We're going to end this episode, but then we'll come right back. We're going to talk about how this power couple in Davis, this power family in Davis, California, uh, ended up dealing with Prop 8 when it came out. Uh, what would have, what could possibly lead to uh, the fa- you know members of their family losing their testimony? And then we're going to learn what happened when they found out that they had a gay daughter. And, uh, and then after that, we're going to talk about rebuilding a life after Orthodox Mormonism Good. When, when things fall apart. So thanks to you uh, guys for your stories. Kids, thanks to you. And Mormon Stories listeners, thanks to you. Uh, we'll uh, see you on the flip side for more goodness more Purvis goodness. (laughs) Thank you. So stay tuned. Thanks, everybody.